Good morning, everybody. Great to see you. So glad you're here today. And if you're joining us online, we're really glad you're with us this morning. So uh, just a couple of things I want to mention before I get into the sermon. First of all, happy Father's Day to all of you who are dads. Uh, congratulations and happy Father's Day. So uh, call your dad if you can and tell him you love him. <clears throat> so a quick word, too, I want to let you know about you may be, uh, thank you very much. You may know that uh, we are in a rhythm of doing annual trips to Israel with Hope Church. And the idea as this is developing is that Pete Bowell and I alternate years leading those trips. So we have a trip scheduled for this coming October. This is Pete's year, he'll be leading it. And there'll be others who are part of leadership on this trip. But just to give you a little flavor for this, I had never been to Israel until about two years ago. And I've heard lots of people who have been to Israel come back and sort of talk about, oh man, you gotta go, you gotta go, you gotta go. To be very honest, some of them were like such aggressive proselytizers about this that it kind of turned me off and left me sort of cold, including some who, maybe they didn't say this, but I felt it sort of insinuated, if you haven't been to Israel, you're not really a Christian. So that did not fly for me. Okay, so against those headwinds, I went to Israel two years ago, and here's what I would say. It was an incredible experience for me, and I've been twice in the last few years. Incredible personally, an incredible experience in terms of my faith. So if this is something that you've thought about or you're praying about, we'd love to encourage you. There's an interest meeting next Sunday after the 11 o'clock worship service in the multi-purpose room. Some folks understandably have concerns about safety, our contact and partner in Israel, who is an Israeli, is very attuned to these questions. And what I could say to you is, if it's not gonna be safe, the trip will be postponed, so you don't have to worry about it. If the trip is on, it's gonna be safe, and you won't have to worry about safety. Now, I know if you've never been, you can still think, eh, I'm not sure I'm buying that. All I can say is now I've been a couple of times, and I feel that that's trustworthy. So if you're interested, check it out in an interest meeting a week from today after this service in the multi-purpose room. We'd love to have you be a part of it. Excuse me, I don't like to do this, but I've got a little frogginess going on. <clears throat> We're in this series about beholding Jesus throughout the summer. As I've been mentioning, it's just taking a look at this person, Jesus Christ, from slightly different angles, week by week by week, hoping that we get glimpses of the fullness and the nuances, the magnitude, the majesty of who it is that we're dealing with. So today we're talking about Jesus the friend. I think the language of friendship is nuanced. When we talk about friends and friendship, we often try to place a relationship somewhere on some kind of a continuum or a scale. For instance, Let's say somebody asks you, hey, are you a friend of so-and-so? And maybe you're thinking, I've met them, but I don't know that I could consider this a friendship. So you might say, well, I don't know that we would say we're friends, but yes, I've met them. So what's keeping us from saying we're friends? Interesting question. Let's take it like one step further. Let's say somebody says, hey, are you a friend of so-and-so? And you're like, I know this person, I see them occasionally, if we were to see each other, we would chat a little bit and say, how are you doing? But we don't have what you would probably call a friendship. So maybe we call that an acquaintance. Okay, so then somewhere along the line, someone says, hey, are you a friend of so-and-so? And you say, yes. What's that invisible dynamic, that ingredient, that sort of crossed the line from we've met or we're acquaintances to we're friends? I think it means that at some level, we have a personal aspect to our relationship. That this has gone further than superficialities and the occasional running into each other. There's an intentionality and the relationship has personal elements to it. <clears throat> then once we start talking about friends, we get onto the continuum in another way. For instance, so-and-so, do you know so-and-so? Are they a friend of yours? And then we would start using words like, yes, that person is a really good friend of mine. Okay, so that describes it one way. We might go to the next level and say, that person is a very close friend of mine. Or maybe that person is one of my best friends. Or 
maybe even more fully, that person is one of my very dearest friends. So when we're talking about friendship, we're kind of moving along a continuum the way we describe it. What about your spouse if you're married? I think sometimes we haven't really thought too much about that. Hopefully, if we're fortunate, we could say about our spouse, he or she is my dearest friend. Friendship is the core of heartfelt relationships. It's the foundation and the mortar of heartfelt relationships. But sometimes I feel that when we talk about friendship, we're kind of like, ah, this seems sort of benign, kind of innocuous, like not that big a deal, not that important, not that significant in life. Hopefully, if we can grasp some of what Jesus is talking about in this section of scripture, we might see friendship elevated to something quite beautiful and very significant in our lives. This is Jesus speaking to the disciples, and we're in John chapter 15. He says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command, love each other. So you notice that this teaching on friendship, which has beautiful, rich content in it, it's bookended by love one another. And then Jesus is going to elevate this way of loving one another in friendships by making sacrificing ourselves for each other the core MO of what makes a friendship what it is. So if you're a person that didn't have too much background with Christianity or religion in general, Sometimes I feel like religion is like this big, abstract, sort of amorphous monster category. And we're not quite sure what to do with it all. Like, if you're not a, quote, religious person, we're like, what in the world do I do with all of this? Well, Jesus and Christianity, for some people, can also feel sort of equally big, amorphous, mysterious, abstract, and so on. Like, what is this really? Like, what are we really doing? What is this really all about? In today's teaching, we're being given an invitation into an important aspect of what Christianity is all about. What it's all about, as Jesus is inviting us in this text, is a friendship with Jesus Christ. A friendship with Jesus Christ. A friendship that becomes our first and most intimate relationship in our lives. That's really the essence of the invitation that Jesus is making to us. Christianity, at its core, is a friendship, an intimate and growing friendship with Jesus Christ as the first friendship and first relationship in our lives. Okay, so on the one hand, I think that sort of normalizes things because religion, we're all like, what do we do with all this religious stuff? There's all kind of trappings and practices and sacred books and all this kind of stuff. So when Jesus says, I have called you friends, I think we're like, okay, I know what friendship is. I can do friendship. I get it. It sort of normalizes what this whole Christian question is about. Well, what is a friendship that's really a rich and meaningful friendship got in it? Well, I think it has time together. I think it has a certain level of transparency. A meaningful and rich friendship has levels of sincerity where we speak to one another about what's true inside of us, what is honest, what is vulnerable. A real friendship certainly would have the value of loyalty woven into it. There would be truth-telling. I think in a rich friendship, there would be expressions of affection. There would be a sense of gratitude and stating this gratitude to each other. I'm grateful for you there would be a deep sense of listening to each other. When we wrap all these words together, they begin to mean what I mean when I use the word intimacy. And intimacy lands in different people's minds in very different ways. A lot of times men express friendship. You know, we can make jokes about this. It's sort of awkward. Like, 
you know, how do men interact with each other and express friendship? Hey, dude, love seeing you. Okay. And then men will say things like when they're really taking a risk, they're like, hey, man, love you, buddy. Love you too, buddy. Okay. Then we cut off the buddy part to go one step even more intimate. Love you. It's very rare for men to say in a healthy, rich friendship, I love you. In many respects, this is what Jesus will teach us to do, and then he will demonstrate how we do it by giving his life for us. So on the one hand, to describe Christianity as a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, as the first relationship in our, in our lives, I think in many ways it really normalizes it, like, okay, I can do that. But then it also adds a lot of mystery to it. How do you have a relationship with a guy who lived 2,000 years ago? Well, this is all part and parcel of what it means to grow as a Christian. I'm growing in my relationship with Jesus Christ through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, through my growing relationship with him. Okay. So on the one hand, it normalizes it. But on the other hand, look at the way he's describing what a real friendship is. He says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. In other words, it takes the idea of friendship, sort of the Hallmark card version in our culture, and it lifts the bar to something quite more significant. It makes it much more rigorous. I wrote in my note that it rigorizes our understanding. And then I thought, you can't say that. That's not a word. And then I thought, I don't care. I really like that word, and so I'm using it. So it both normalizes our understanding of Christianity and friendships, and it also rigorizes our understanding of friendship and relationships. Note that his fundamental core is that greater love is no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. That is a magnificent and towering statement. I think you've probably heard me say this a lot. I say it a lot because I think it's in the air, and I'm not sure we're aware that it's in the air. But to speak of relationships with this platform to lay down your life for your friends, in a culture like ours where consumerism and consumption is the air we breathe, it is almost like, talk about two ships passing in the night. Because we live in a culture where every message is consumption and what you get out of it. What does this give me? I've heard people say, I tried this Christian thing and it didn't give me anything. That is fundamentally missing the nature of what we're all about in this. So Jesus is saying that greater love is no one than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. In other words, the core of the kind of friendship he's talking about is that we are sacrificing ourselves for the well-being of the other. The message of friendship that is premised on sacrifice is like a foreign language to people in our culture where the cultural air is all about consumerism and consumption. And this is how he's setting this up. Okay, so Jesus is talking to the disciples, his friends. He, in a sense, is speaking to any of us who have said, yes, I receive you as Lord and Savior of my life. And what Jesus will do in his friendship with these guys is he will allow them to know his heart. At some level, this would be a core element of what friendship means, right? We have professional relationships. It, probably not that appropriate in your professional relationships to be bringing people into the center of your heart. I mean, it can vary, but you get what I mean. When we are beginning to give people access into our hearts, now we're talking about friendship in a significant way. Jesus is saying to the disciples, and he will demonstrate it over the years that he's with them, he is giving them access into his heart. Psalm 25, 14 says, the Lord confides in those who fear him and reveals his covenant to them. This to me suggests that the more I am devoted to Christ, the more over time he confides and reveals things to me reveals the truth of his own heart, reveals the heartbeat and his vision that sustains him and to which we are called to participate. But that doesn't happen overnight. And it says in the Bible that he confides in those who fear him. Use the word revere him, are devoted to him as Lord and Savior. Over time, as we grow in that relationship with him, he will confide in us. He will reveal, if you could say it, the secrets of the heart of God to us. 
But that doesn't happen through billboards and passing ships in the night. That happens through a deep, growing, abiding relationship. When Jesus Christ says to the disciples, this whole thing that we're doing, this thing that I'm doing with you is, I've called you my friends, the idea of friendship is being elevated to magnificent levels. What Jesus is saying is that friendship is the core relationship of life. There are different kinds of relationships, right? There are work relationships, and there are all kinds of different relationships. He's saying friendship is the core of life. In all of the confusions of life, here's what Jesus is saying. If you want clarity to sort out all the haze, all the what should I be doing with my life, what's important, what matters, where should I go, how should I plan my life, what my priorities should be, what he's saying here is if you want to clarify your life, Pursue an intimate growing relationship with me as your first and most intimate relationship in life. And then everything else will begin to find its place. Brennan Manning says, someday somewhere I'm going to meet that person who really understands me, understands the words I speak and even the words that I leave unspoken. The gospel proclaims that Jesus of Nazareth is the fulfillment of that dream. Note that for many of us in our culture, when we think we're going to find the person who really understands me, many of us are thinking, I'm going to find a spouse. I'm going to find a, a, a something like a marriage relationship. And note that he's saying, no, Jesus Christ becomes that person in our lives. I'll come back to that in a minute. So occasionally, you've probably heard me talk about the Apostle Peter. Peter is the most illustrated of all the apostles, the disciples, of Jesus' disciples. We see more of him, we hear more from him, we get to know his personality more than any of the others. So he's most depicted in the Gospels. His relationship with Jesus is also that friendship that is really elevated as the closest of the friendships among all the apostles, at least as we read it in the Gospels. So Peter is a fascinating character study. Peter is impetuous, he's passionate, he's focused, and he's fickle, and he has the three eyes that I talked about last week. Last week I mentioned that we're used to thinking that every human being has two eyes, we actually have three. The three are insecurities, identity deficits, and idols. And so all of us human beings, include me, of course, have identity deficits, insecurities, and idols. And we're dealing with and trying to pursue a friendship with Jesus Christ who does not have these three eyes. He does not have identity deficits, insecurities, and idols. This means relating with him is going to be interesting, to say the least. So as Jesus has called Peter to have this relationship with him, he called him right there on the beach of the Sea of Galilee. He was fishing. He calls, Jesus, he calls Peter to follow him. He does, dropped his nets, and he followed him. Over the three years that we're to, they are together, you see a lot of fascinating things happen in their experiences, including at one particular time, where Peter says to Jesus, I will never leave you. I will lay down my life for you. And then a little while later, when the heat is on, and Jesus has been taken into custody by the Roman and Jewish leaders, and then someone says to Peter, hey, you're one of his friends, right? Peter basically says, never met the guy. It's a heart-wrenching moment. It's also an invitation into our own hearts. What is this thing that I'm doing with Jesus? What is this religion relationship thing that I'm doing with him? So to give you an illustration, you may know this account, but Jesus is going to restore Peter back to full position and friendship and restoration. And he's going to do it. It has to be very close to the very same beach where he called Peter to follow him to begin with. I like to call this full circle redemption. From the place where Jesus called Peter and then three years of life together, Peter's abject failure of loyalty to Jesus, and then back on the same beach where they began, Jesus interacts with Peter. Let me read this to you in English, but there's some important Greek nuances. When they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt 
Because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Greek, you may know, has several words for love. There's agape, which is unconditional love. There's eros, which is more physical attraction, sexual kind of love. There is phileo, from which we get like Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. That's like affection and heartwarming relationship. When Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? The first time he says, do you love me unconditionally? Do you agape love me? Do you love me unconditionally? Peter responds and he says, he uses phileo. He says, Jesus, I really like you and I'm fond of you. So imagine that. Do you love me unconditionally? I really like you. I'm fond of you. Then Jesus asks him again, do you love me unconditionally? And Peter responds using the same word. I like you. You mean a lot to me. I'm fond of you. It's a crucible moment. What is happening here is that Peter's character is being rebuilt in the loving and rigorous invitation from Jesus. When Jesus says, do you love me unconditionally, Peter has to look back to a week ago and say, well, if I answer yes to that, obviously I just failed that test magnificently, just in a crashing ball of fire. So when Jesus says, do you love me, I think before what had happened a week ago when Peter denied him, Peter would have said, of course I love you. I'll give myself for you. But Peter now has a track record that he has to assess with integrity. So Jesus says, you love me unconditionally. And Peter says, I, 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 I like you. I'm fond of you. You mean a lot to me. But he's not responding with that same bravado. Jesus says to him again, do you love me unconditionally? He says, I like you. You mean a lot to me. I'm fond of you. From there, Jesus says to him, do you like me? Are you fond of me? Peter responds, Lord, you know all things. In other words, you know my heart, you know my character failings, you know everything that I've done, you know the way I've had a high bar, I spoke with bravado and I flunked the test, so yes, I like you and I'm fond of you. Can we start there? That's the starting place where Jesus will restore him into this loving friendship with him. So here's a question. This is what I had written in my notes. From blank, like underscore, from blank, to a faithful and true friendship with Jesus. In other words, let me be really honest about what would fill in that blank. Like, what am I doing with you, Jesus? And I wonder if you would consider this exercise as a little spiritual growth inventory as well. But you have to fill in that blank with a very authentic and honest statement. From blank to a faithful and true friendship with Jesus Christ. Like, what might some examples be? I don't know, from dabbling, from being a consumer of what I think you ought to be giving me, Jesus, from playing religion, from a facade and an outward picture that I know isn't true on the inside. Whatever is an honest statement of your own self-assessment, being honest, filling in that blank, is a beautiful invitation to grow from that place to a faithful and true friendship. Proverbs 18 says, one who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. So here's the question I ask myself when I read that. Jesus, am I a reliable friend to you? Jesus, when you think about your friendship with me and when I think about my friendship with you, I think because we live in a consumer culture, we all sort of look at Christianity and say, what's Jesus going to do for me? My question when I first read that is, Jesus, am I a reliable friend to you? Would I own my relationship with you if the heat was on? Would I identify myself with you as my friend if there was pressure and possibly persecution? These are deeper questions that this invitation to friendship is impacting on me. So what is this thing that I'm doing with Jesus? Would a healthy, normal friendship work if I did that with a friend? If I was casual, or if I was self-centered, or if I was looking at this for what you're going to give me, a, quote, healthy relationship will fall apart if my self-centrism and my consumerism is the core driver of the friendship. A relationship that's healthy won't work on that self-centrism. It'll collapse under the weight of that center. OK, so <clears throat> here's this challenging question, right? We're talking about Jesus. So on the one hand, we're talking about, yes, yeah, a friendship. He's talking so normally, like, just have a friendship with me. OK, but you are Jesus after all. Just have a friendship with you. I need to begin to get to know you and learn to trust you in order for a friendship to happen. That's true. Like a normal friendship, that's true. 
So for instance, trust becomes the foundation upon which a friendship grows. But the only way you can begin to trust someone is that you begin to get to know them. And as you begin to get to know them, if a bit of a repeated track record of reliability builds up, then we begin to trust them. But trust requires knowing, right? So take, for example, I'm at a party, and it's a very sort of meet and greet, grip and grin kind of affair. And so it's walk around, stick their hand. Hey, I'm David. How are you? Nice to meet you. Hey, David, I'm Bill. What do you do? Well, Bill, what do you do? It's easier for me to ask you that question. So Bill, what do you do? And Bill says, well, you know, I'm in sales. Great. Bill, do you trust me? What, do I what? Do I trust you? What kind of a weird question is that? I don't even know you. That would be what he would be thinking if he didn't say it. What do you mean, do I trust you? I don't even know you. Ah, you see, this reveals, I can't trust you if I don't know you. And so when Jesus is inviting us into this relationship with him that has a growing trust where the intimacy becomes the central core of life, vitality, and health in our lives, this will require knowing him. But trust is like, it's like a very mysterious thing. You have to have a little bit of it to get a bunch more. So how does this work with Jesus? Here's my take on it. In John chapter 7, Jesus spoke about living water. He basically said, I'm the living water. And if you come and give your life to me, springs of water will well up within you. He's speaking of the Holy Spirit bringing his life to us. But he's using the analogy, if you want life that's really life, you're going to find it in me. I'm the living water. So this makes my little head go in a lot of different directions. So here's my thought. Let's say you spilled water and it's on your kitchen counter and you want to soak it up. So you've got a sponge that's also on the kitchen counter. But let's say that sponge has been sitting there for five days and it hasn't been used. So it's bone dry, it's a little curvy, you know, it's kind of dry and all that. And so if you took a bone dry sponge, i.e. there's no water in it, and moved it through this water, it won't soak any of the water up. It's just gonna push it around. In a mysterious irony, you got to get a little water into the sponge in order for the sponge to be able to soak up more. So what would we normally do? You'd take that sponge, put it under the faucet, wring it out, make it moist, put a little water into it, and then you move it through this water and it soaks up more water. Trust is like that. you got to have a little in order to get a lot more. So where's that starting point going to come from for us in our relationship with Jesus? This is how the Holy Spirit moves in our lives to give us small little bits of water so we can begin to soak up more. I think the other thing you could do to try to soak it up is you could take that dry sponge and you could just set it in that water and just let it sit there for a while. And if you just let it soak in the water, in time it'll begin to soak that water up. It's got to soak there for a while. So maybe you're here at Hope and you're trying to figure out this whole Jesus thing. And you've got a lot of questions, good questions. Maybe you've got some skepticism. One invitation I would make would be just come and soak here for a while. Just come soak. Ask your questions, be here. And in time, my prayer for you would be that you're going to begin to take in the living water of Jesus. So as we begin to have a little bit of trust that comes with knowing, then we begin to be, have a reliable track record with Jesus and our trust grows and the intimacy with Jesus grows. And Jesus Christ as our first relationship and friendship becomes the center and the life-giving core of our lives. Ralph Waldo Emerson said it this way, the glory of friendship is not the outstretched hand, nor the kindly smile, nor the joy of companionship. It's the spiritual inspiration that comes when we discover that someone else believes in you and is willing to trust in you. Could you begin from this starting point? Could you hear Jesus say to you, I believe in you and I trust you? And with that beginning point, could we begin to approach him and seek to respond in kind? Jesus, I believe in you and I trust you. Part of our challenge, of course, is that we all have the three eyes: insecurities, identity deficits, and idols. And this means that fear and mistrust is just a little tiny scratch beneath the surface in our relationships. So because we've got the three eyes and we're having a relationship with Jesus who doesn't have the three eyes, anything that hints into our fears that he hasn't held up his end of the bargain can make us run from him. It's understandable, but he's the one who will demonstrate his faithfulness, his loyalty to us by giving his life for us. But without knowing it, many of us tried this Christianity thing 
by entering into this relationship with Jesus on a consumptive core value. And the whole starting point has been, well, Jesus, what are you doing for me? And what are you doing to make my life better? No relationship would work if one or both of the people were saying, hey, I'm in this to see what you're doing for me and how you're making my life better. It'll collapse at the self-centrism of the core. Okay, so Jesus is laying out that friendship is the core of relating. Without it, any personal relationship will wither. Friendship, back to the beginning, these words like transparency and sincerity and vulnerability and expressions of affection and gratitude and trust and so on. Friendship is the core of relating. Without it, any personal relationship withers. So you might say, it's Father's Day. What about family, especially family? Families that have the richest relationships have the richest friendships in the midst of the relationships. Marriages that have the richest joy have the richest friendships at the center of the relationship. As children grow and mature and more parity of life experience comes along, the relationship between parent and child that becomes most life-giving, it becomes the richest of friendships. And so Jesus is inviting us into this kind of relating. In our culture that has basically said that a relationship or a romantic relationship requires sex is completely missing the point of friendship as Jesus is laying this out before us. C.S. Lewis said it this way, Eros will have naked bodies, friendship will have naked personalities. In other words, if you think you can build a friendship because of Eros and sex, that will fall apart too because it doesn't have the mortar that makes a relationship rich and growing. So. If you think that you're gonna build a beautiful marriage or a beautiful relationship on sex, in time it'll fall apart. But you can have beautiful sex as a result of a rich, beautiful, committed friendship at the center of a marriage. I think you see it. So Jesus is saying, this is how this friendship works. I give myself unconditionally to you, and I'm inviting you into this kind of dynamic with me. If our core MO of a relationship is, I'm in this so, so you will understand me, that self-centrism will challenge any relationship and likely sabotage it. The core then, in the practical expression of friendships, would be, I want to be in this to understand you. And the core starting point of that is going to be learning to be a great listener. So I'm going to close, and I'm going to just offer, say, five principles for friendship seeking to grow these and glean them out of this John 15 text. First one is that friendship is the foundation, the core platform of any vital personal relationship. Secondly, to succeed in life, if you could say it that way, resolve to learn how to be a good friend. Step one to doing this is to become a good listener. Number three, to, to be, quote, successful in friendships, we must be in them to give rather than to get. Number four, Fruitfulness for Jesus is the result of friendship with Jesus. And number five, make Jesus Christ your first most intimate friend. From this center, our lives grow toward inward and outward health. That's whether you're married or single. If you're married, make Jesus your first most intimate friend. That'll help you become healthy inwardly and outwardly and enable you to love your spouse with appropriated expectations, not trying to get them to be God for you. If you're single, make Jesus your first most intimate friend. Because as believers, whether we're married or single, this is the first most intimate relationship to feed our souls that we're all invited into. So beholding Jesus as friend, let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you today and we come as people who receive all of this information, I think in various different ways, depending on our background, our story, our own level of faith, how dry or moist we are as a sponge. So we pray, Holy Spirit, will you move and work in our lives? Because we hear you teach this, Jesus, and I feel sure that in almost every one of us, there's this, yes, I want that. The question is, how do we get there? So we pray, Lord, that as a church, as a body together of believers, you'll help us help each other into this growing, 
rich, intimate friendship with you. Come, Holy Spirit, into our lives and help this happen, we pray in your name. Amen.